welcome to a very special episode of Lynx River Talk. Yep, today we interview a very special guest, Daryl Shuttleworth or Arthur Curtis. Who plays the very infamous Albert's lawyer as well as FBI agent number two. Yep, so without further ado, let's get into the interview. Enjoy. So, you were born in Vancouver, B.C.? New right. Westminster, B.C. Okay. New Westminster. Okay, so they got it wrong. Which, which used to be the capital of British Columbia. Oh, it was right. New Westminster. That's oh. why they call it the Royal City. But they moved it to Victoria so, they could, so the politicians could make more money. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. I don't, I don't know why they moved to Victoria. But. Wow. Um, yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> and where are you based? Where are you based? Ontario, um, near Grand Bend. Near Grand Bend. Yeah. Okay, so near Blythe. Yep. I don't near even Blythe. know where that is. <laughs> yeah, Blythe pretty, Festival. Yeah, yeah Grand Bend, there. Blythe, Goderich, and all that. Isn't that around that area? We, yes. kind, of, we kind of just moved. Um, I'm born from Stratford, so. Right. That's Stratford, more my of area. There you go. That's the theater town. <laughs> beautiful part of the world. Beautiful part of the world. Thanks. Yeah, yeah well, BC is obviously beautiful, too. Yes, right? it's been one place yes. I've been dying to go to. I've got a lot of um, very distant relatives up there, actually. Well, and my make great, them less, my great make them less distant. And, <laughs> like, very distant cousins, like third or fourth or cousins or something. <laughs> So you've been in a lot of shows, uh, and have. even more movies. Like I was looking up your filmography; it, it listed over forty movies, and there it looked like Google even was missing some when I was looking at other, at other sites as well. So, and, yeah. and then you've been on tons of shows, North of Sixty included, Fargo, yes. X Files, and you've yes. been on tons of movies recently too. So, yeah. yeah. So, was there any particular people in those shows you enjoyed working with? I guess it's a lot to draw from. But. <laughs> yeah, I, I, every every show. I mean, the, the amazing thing about what uh, we all in the entertainment business is, we're always working with new people. Mm -hmm. So that it, it's always a, a, a blessing and sometimes a curse <laughs> because if you're stuck with somebody who, you know, might have some and. You know what? I try not to. To in my earlier days as an actor, I would get that would bother me. Now I just go, okay, that's that person's issue, and fear, and a lot of stuff in this industry is fear based. Be, it, it can be quite frightening when they say roll it, <laughs> and all of a sudden, yeah. and, and, and especially for those of us that are experienced, and I consider myself one of those people. I actually now, when they say rolling, I relax more. I actually get more relaxed oh. because I know that it's important. Uh, and then when you, you know, I've worked on a few shows where actors have had a few years away from it and they come back and that rolling is like, a, it's, oh, uh, and I mean, flop sweat. We're talking like amazing uh, the, on, on a show I won't name, but uh, they said action, and the actor literally was, it was explosive sweating. Like it was, wow. it was, it, but it started, the second action was called, the sweat was immediate, and you just felt like you just, oh, oh, and it was so, you know, and of course, they, the, now we have to cut and get wardrobe to dry costume out and stuff like that and it was but it was it, it, it just goes to show it is a nervous thing you know when yeah, you have yeah. people go oh i'd love to act in front of a camera yeah well wait until you have that massive <laughs> camera and all those people looking at you and people on the script and a director going mm, it's not i didn't cast this person yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well and they can look at every little detail at you from the cameras right so yeah your, yeah. fir your first appearance was actually, some people don't know that, was season yeah. one, episode 11, when Graham Greene came for uh, to play Rico Nez, and right. you played FBI agent number two. Number two? <laughs> yes. I one. No, I, I double-checked the credits. You're number two. <laughs> <laughs> they lied to you. <laughs> yes. yes, they did. So how did you go from that role where you're just in it for like two seconds to a character yeah. where you actually 
are reoccurring and people look forward to you being there. You're a very interesting character who definitely stirs up a lot of drama. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I don't know, I think it was one of the producers, uh, uh, Lauderman, um, he, he, uh, he liked me, he just liked me, and they had that part for the FBI, and I thought there was going to maybe do something more with it, but they didn't, mm -hmm. but it was an opportunity to meet Graham Greene, which uh, I, I saw on stage in Montreal many years before, and was absolutely blown away by his abilities and his just his just his talent, raw talent. Yeah. So that was great, and I actually got to drink with with Graham, <laughs> wow. and then did a movie did a movie years later with him, and oh. got to drink again with him, which was which was fun. Okay. Uh, but I think you know, for a lot of these shows, I don't, you know, like Supernatural, I did two of those. I've done two Stargates, playing totally different characters. Yeah. It is it is episodic television, and there is only so many actors available especially in Calgary at the time mm -hmm. they were primarily hiring tr trying to hire out of Calgary first or Alberta mm -hmm. uh, first and then they would move a field now obviously for the bigger guest star roles they did there was no you know they didn't, it doesn't matter and nor should it uh, mm -hmm. you know we're all vagabonds and wherever they decide to cast from they cast from um, so I think it was just that the part came up and I was supposed to be just a one -er, where I came in and I was just a lawyer to, I can't remember the first, ep I, I, it's a long time ago. <laughs> and, and then uh, I got, they gave me a call and they said, we're thinking of, you know, and, and so I was in another episode and what was interesting, it was my smirk that <laughs> seemingly <laughs> bothered them and also excited them. <laughs> and uh, so they would always write in, uh, whatever my character's name was. Arthur Smirks. Curtis. Uh, Arthur Curtis, okay. Uh, it, it, it gives a self-satisfied smirk or something. And I realized, uh, so it's this this little little uh, teethless. There yeah. it is. <laughs> then there it is. And I didn't even know I had it. And, and, and you know, or I did that. Uh, but it was, I was playing, I knew, I was a lawyer. I was playing a, a lawyer who was a bit self-satisfied. The nice thing was is, you know, I got a chance to work with Gordon all the time. Which uh, was, yes, he is amazing. That's what we were, which one was, question we wanted to ask you about. Yeah, really, uh, 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 you know, yeah, not only an incredible actor, but uh, I don't want to get emotional, but an incredible human being. I mean, really can't stress it enough that there was a, there was a strength that Gordon had that was undeniable. It came across on screen. Yeah, you could it came across... It in person you you could feel it his his beauty uh, as a just a human being sorry it's it's a and, and it was uh, when he passed away it was i was just you know i knew he was he was good because he'd done so much good on this pl this place so mm -hmm. but yeah that was the greatest thrill him and tracy cook uh getting to work with her quite often and uh a good friend of mine bob boxstall I don't know if I did any scenes with him, but he was there for a couple of years doing yeah. the show. Yeah, I and, actually uh, recall a scene with you two. Um. Yeah, yeah. So Bobby was, that's right, we, yeah, we did do a scene. That's right, we did. And he was in, I think, in the office. I remember with mm -hmm. Tina as well. Yeah. It was, and and it, it was like a little family. And I don't know how many uh, people you've talked to, but North of 60 became a very tight little family. Mm -hmm. um, and what was unique about it is we'd go to set about 8 o'clock in the morning and be done at 5. So it was a regular day. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like these 15-hour days. If they had it done to, uh, by, especially by the end, it's just, it, it, was, it was fun. It was fast. We would block shoot. So we would, if I did any scenes with Dakota at, in the last season, I remember we shot four scenes and they were long scenes where he's in the office and we shot all his stuff in the morning and then shot all my stuff in the afternoon mm -hmm. and it was like four different so you know uh it, it was it was they really had it down well and they trusted us and we trusted them that was the main thing it wasn't just turning sausages it really was okay here's the scene we've got this this is the reality of the situation we're going to block shoot so rehearse now get it done and then we'll move on so it was it was a and a great family. I mean, the producers I thought were fantastic. The fact that Jordan Wheeler, uh, 
is a very successful writer and a, a, another swell human being. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, and so many of the performers. Have, we have to remember that at the time it was a unique show for, it, especially for Indigenous performers. Mm -hmm. There, there hadn't been a show like that. Maybe early on uh, in CBC history, they had a few. I remember Rainbow Country. Uh, I don't know if you, you're probably too young for that. I, that's like my wife is a lot younger yeah. than me. Yeah, nineties, <laughs> late nineties. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Like, and I'm, He's I'm not even 70s. familiar with Rainbow Country myself, but I have heard yeah. of it. Yeah, it, 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 you know, but it had the stock indigenous characters in it, mm -hmm. whereas North of 60 really was uh, an, an honest, and uh, and I, I, I don't know if, if, if this has been, how much public knowledge is known about this, but the first season, I was actually the president of, of Actor of Calgary, mm -hmm. so at that time, our actors union was kind of going through a, not a breakup, but we were being more autonomous, mm -hmm. so... Um, the model used to be the national organization would run all the places and pick. Well, that broke up into such a way that we all ran our own little show uh, or our own thing and had to deal with things on a local level. So North of 60, when it started up, uh, they had some requests that were outside the agreement. They didn't want to uh, have lesser rates or anything. They just wanted some changes to acknowledge the indigenous uh, performers they were going to have to find to, oh. to be in the show especially in the background so mm -hmm. things so so we we made variances with them we had to sit down and we didn't meet you know face to face with them because we're all actors we didn't want to be you know i, I had to warn people look guys we're not currying favor to try to get jobs yeah. uh, and people did accuse me of that actually because <laughs> i was the president of the union that i was on north the 60s so, oh this is you know which is silly of course it's silly because yeah. there's no they're not going to put bad actors, not that I'm saying I'm a good one, but you're going to get cast because you're right for the role. It just makes common sense. Yeah. So the, the producers were adamant that they wanted to do the show right, and they wanted to honor the indigenous performers that were at the center of the show. Mm -hmm. And after the first season, they had an indigenous uh, advisory panel that watched the show and would give feedback. And this panel said, don't believe it for a second after the first season that you aren't telling the truth about our uh, many of our communities the difficulties you have to start showing the difficulties and if you notice between season one and season two there is a change there's a shift uh -huh. where you start to see more more of the issues that but real issues of, mm -hmm. of, of, ec of economics of of uh, you know, autonomy, uh, I mean, real issues, and then social issues, drug mm -hmm. use, uh, gang activity, all that stuff actually came up after the first season. Yeah. And it, 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 it was it was dealt with in a much more, I mean, look at the, the circle at the end of the last season where they had the justice circle for, um, was it the last season? It may not have been the last season. They had one for Nathan. Yeah, for Nathan, where, where he was banished, where he was he was like, oh, you go. And I remember sitting, shooting that scene and being, you know, I'm in this row behind him going, this is, it's very powerful. Everybody's facing everybody. There's no, you can't hide. And it, it was really a beautiful thing, but difficult to shoot, mind you, it was <laughs> because you're in a circle. Yeah. So you had to have the camera on a track to go around, and it was very difficult to, to do, but... So, so in that way, the show was very unique for how many uh, indigenous performers' careers were were enhanced, and like someone like uh, Tom Jackson, I mean Tina Keeper. These are yeah. you know Tom was known, but he was really known after that show, and so was Tina. Yeah. You know, uh, and the Cardinal family, Gil would direct them, and, and uh, Tattoo, of course, was on them. They, these are important. Ben Cardinal, uh, Adam Beach. I mean, you think about the, the yeah. performers whose careers were launched, mm -hmm. or at least aided by North of 60. Um, and Dakota, you know, Dakota okay. House. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Wilma Pelly, there's somebody, not an actor per se, mm -hmm. but Wilma had a, how many years on that show? It was mm -hmm. there from beginning to end. Yeah, and, she was uh, uh, a character yeah. that you just loved. Yeah, and Jimmy Herman, you, you've got people that, that weren't uh, quote-unquote actors, but that's what the producers wanted. They mm -hmm. wanted the stories to be, you know, I mean, 
it, it's done now, but then it was it was really considered like, well, what are they doing it's over there? It's almost like reality TV, yeah. It, well, I think they wanted, I mean, certainly, it wasn't overtly political, the show, but just the fact that it survived as long as it did, it was a political statement that, you know, we're here, <laughs> and look at, you know, APN, and, or, uh, oh, that's the wrong, no, uh, Aboriginal, oh. anyway, APTN, I always get it wrong, <laughs> APTN, I mean, and, and there's shows like Tribal, and, and, you know, shows have continued to, you know, and it shouldn't be ghettoized, that that was the great thing about North of 60, it wasn't just like, oh, this is for those indigenous people, no, it wasn't, my dad, who passed away 10 years ago, uh, he would call me, wherever I was, hey, you're on TV right now, son, it's like, <laughs> You know, I did, I don't know, five episodes, six episodes, I don't know how many episodes I did, and he watched it, and it was always on reruns on CBC during the day. Have you watched the show all the way through yourself? No, I have not. I don't watch my stuff. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I'm not one of those, uh, I've occasionally watched stuff, uh, and, and actually it, because of the pandemic, I've been watching my stuff a lot more, mostly just for auditions. Oh. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's tough. It's, it's, uh, it's good, but it's tough because you realize, oh, you're not very good. That's, that's not very we good. We love Arthur Curtis. <laughs> no, no, I'm not talking about Arthur Curtis, obviously. But, but I, I think as actors, we're always trying to we think, oh, I'm a multicolored butterfly. I can do anything. And the, 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 real, the reality is, no, no, you can't. <laughs> At least I can't. Now, oh. I know some actors who are that way, who can be uh, metamorphized themselves and can do something with their face. They just, they just have that ability. And we all know those actors that we've seen that we go, how, oh, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis being a prime example of somebody who go, no, he hasn't changed his look, but everything about his physiology and just his psyche, everything seems different. Yeah. I mean, uh, Lincoln is a master class. Uh, uh, there Will Be Blood is is by far, I personally think. Last uh, of the you know, Last of the uh, Phantom Thread, which is the most recent That's one, really Phantom Thread is, un he's unbelievable in it. It's an unbelievable relationship, the two actors mm -hmm. uh the female actor i think she's french or belgian she's an and i thought oh he's gonna wipe the floor with her <laughs> and she was toe-to-toe -to -toe. it was an incredible just incredible uh movie so if you want a really good roller coaster ride that's very slow moving but it's an amazing the tension that rises in that movie is unbelievable <laughs> anyway i'm not that kind of actor so <laughs> i tend to be uh, of strengths right <laughs> Yeah, and, and I tend to just, and you, you realize as the more longer you get in this, I look a certain way, there's a certain hit. When I walk into an audition room, they go, that's a football coach, that's a lawyer, that's a cop. Those are ones that sit, but, you know, I'm in that range. Now, uh, I have played a few sickos in my day, which I'm always happy about because I don't tend to get, I'll get jerks. I'll get, you know, I get a lot of jerks. <laughs> I don't know why that is. It's funny because you're <laughs> such a nice guy. Yeah, and I know. You have a no, con no. contrast yeah. to your actual character. That well, said, maybe I not. Know, <laughs> maybe not, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> be careful when you. Uh, well, of course, I do a lot of Hallmark, and I've done four Christmas movies where I play Henry the Farmer. And uh, he is exactly that. He's a nice guy, he's a great father, he's emotionally in touch, which I think I that's who I am. But Quite frankly, who are we all? You know, really, who who are we? Meh. You know, and as actors, we should be emotionally open to, to try anything. So, uh -huh. uh, yeah. Besides acting, you also do some amazing woodworking. I uh, I didn't see your project from the beginning, so for me, it was a lot of guesswork as to trying to figure out what it was. So it was really interesting watching it come along, and he knew what it was right away. I like showed him some pictures. He's like, "It's some sort of sh it's shelving," you know. I'm like, "How do you know this?" <laughs> well, but I don't know. Did, I, 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 I I I I did used to work it. It used to have uh, loved woodworking when I was in school like in high school oh, yeah. and then of course you know having all those access to all those tools was only at school not at uh, i couldn't afford you know these planers and 
you know, table saws and stuff. So it really has been till we moved here to Nanaimo five years ago, or no, not five years ago, uh, two and a half years ago, that I had a, a garage again so that I could, and I had a shop in Calgary for a short time, but it was in a tiny shed, and anytime I had to use anything, I had to come out in the yard. And so it's not really a shop. You're, yeah. you're constantly, you know, and I did have a little table saw for, for, for that, but uh, th this shop is the first time I've had you know enough space to be able to have stuff, be able to roll it out, and, and do. And I do. And it's it's a hobby, especially during the pandemic. It's been, you know, a lifesaver to go down there and breathe in dust. <laughs> yeah, well, it gives you an escape, right? Yeah, yeah, and some money on the side. I build little things and occasionally sell them. So, yeah. That's awesome. So, other than Gordon Tatusis, because you work so closely with him, yeah. who is your yeah. favorite person on North of 60 to work with? Uh, well, it wasn't in front of the camera. It was uh, Tim Milligan, who was the uh, dolly grip. Actually, uh, I had to not look at him uh, <laughs> ever during a shot. Ever. 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 And it was really painful to the point where it got in my head when I was, when they were doing, you know, Especially in the in the in the justice circle scene, <sighs> Tim's face just for something about you know he, he's not doing anything, but the fact that he's doing nothing is hysterical. <laughs> so I had to literally go, don't look at him, don't look at him, and he would constantly stare at me, going, <laughs> "I dare you to look." At me. <laughs> so, so I have very fond memories. So every time I work with Tim now, and I have worked with him in Vancouver. Uh, and it was just like I just okay, I'm not looking at you because he's just one of those one of those You're guys. On the project, you know? I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the other thing is, this was like when did the show air from? Uh, 90, 92, was it? Ninety two yeah. to ninety six. Ninety eight, ninety six. Okay, so so it was a different. It just. It really was a different time, and the crew stayed together. We we were together from like first show to end show. It was always it was the same crew for the most part. So mm -hmm. Dean Bennett, and I mean that's who, as actors, you you know we all know the actors, you know. And but you know Tina and Tom were pretty much all day learning lines, and so that they couldn't be social at all uh, mm -hmm. on set. You know, uh, they were a pleasure to work with. Tom was always, uh, you know, very professional. Uh, you know, uh, same with Tina. Tina, is a very sweet person. And I don't know if you've heard. I mean, she's so sweet and so, um, you know, really caring. Like, she really cares. And you can tell she really cared. Uh, uh, now, the, the other weird connection was when I, I went to theater school from 1980 to 83 in Montreal, and there was someone in my class in the first year, and he he, he didn't make it through to the third year, but they, they said, look, you, we think that the, the instructors of the theater school said, we think you could be a dancer. And so they got him in an audition at the National Youth Ballet, and he got in. And uh, that is uh, Peter James Conero. Who played the RCMP officer years later, and it was so great to be able to go. Oh my God! Like that, we started out together at theater school. He took a different path and came right back to it. And there he is playing one of the leads now in the show. And it was so. It was. It was very cool to to see that. Same with Bobby Boxstall. Bobby and I did uh, uh, Blythe together, Blythe Theater Festival together, and he's just an incredible human. But. A, just a fine actor like Bobby is and, and that's the thing oh, those actors in that show were really fine actors uh, Tina incredibly I mean and those young actors you think about Dakota was essentially like a kid yeah a kid. He, and he was practically and, and the star up, of the show and, mm -hmm. yeah and grew up and became a very accomplished and very good at his job mm -hmm. yeah so know, he's uh, still very accomplished he has his uh a business where, which is also going miles. Yeah, which is also a charity, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Going miles. And then Nathaniel Arcan. Um. Nathaniel, yeah, another, yeah, incredible. And these guys were kids, right? Yeah. So I was quite young. I was in my thirties, I think, when when the show when I was working on the show. But these guys were kids, mm -hmm. kids. So you're you're thinking. 
you know, and I've been, I, I, you know, it's interesting because uh, I did a series called Intruders. It was only eight episodes, but we had a young actress who was 10 years old at the time, and that was Millie Bobby Brown. Oh. And we knew, we knew she played the, the bad guy of the series, if you can believe it. <laughs> a 10 year old kid played the bad guy. <laughs> and she, we knew uh, the first day of photography. This kid's going to be a, a, like a star. You you could tell, and it was amazing how. Um, and and you can usually tell because they want it. They want to do it. They enjoy doing it. Whereas in some cases that is not the case. Where you'll see child actors just they don't want to be there. Somebody yeah. else wants them there. Yeah, so exactly. North of sixty always had the people that were there wanted to be there, and mm -hmm. I think it was important, especially to the indigenous community. It was important. It was, it, and, yeah. and I always felt kind of honored to, to be included to the party uh, because it's not my story. It, it, mm -hmm. it, and we need, as, as storytellers, to tell everyone's story. They're all, and we can learn something from every story. Yeah. Unfortunately, we get this kind of, okay, we're going to put this over here, this over here, this over here, and then, you no, know, tell the story. Just tell them. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about category. Just tell a good story. And North of 60, the reason I think it's done so well even in since the day it stopped, it'll be lovely to, to do it, to see it again, to, or even do, uh, I don't know if they've done this, or, you know, one of those round tables where the cast gets together and talk about the show would be really quite an incredible uh, thing to see, to, to see them get together, those that are, you know, are still around to talk about it because... I, it, it blazed the trail that, uh, you know, I don't think there are many shows that have, like, like North 60 did. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Very powerful and very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, that little town outside of Brad Creek they built, it was one funny story I remember in the first season. I was asking a crew, so how is this? This is great. And they go, no, no, the houses are great, but they built real houses. Uh -huh. So for filming, that's not so good because you need little holes in the walls for cables to go through, and they didn't do that. So for the whole first season, they were having to cut holes in doors and stuff, which kind of defeats the purpose of the door. <laughs> <laughs> Until they finally cut holes at the bottom so with, with little things where they could put caps on them for mm -hmm. cables to come through so the doors could operate properly. <laughs> wow. So things like that where... But it was it, it was a huge undertaking. Yeah, well, that's to, to, one of the questions we had for you was what it's like on location there, what it was like to be on location there. It, it was incre it was incredible because they had you know those trailers for mm -hmm. for they had a long trailer I remember for all the dressing rooms and they were essentially construction trailers mm -hmm. and then they had a makeup trailer and then they would have a wardrobe trailer but they were all on site they were all set there they weren't moved in and out like most shoots where you could just pull those out. And this was a little camp and they invested, you know, I think it was about a million dollars is what I heard to build the, build this thing. Then there was one year where I think there were some flooding. So they had to actually pull the buildings back and try to save them. Wow. If I recall correctly. Yeah, no, it's a, uh, it, it's a, uh, and it was, it was a challenge to get, it was about a half hour if I recall correctly from Calgary, maybe a little more to the site. So there would be shuttles that they would run, and I remember being on a shuttle with Gordon going back to town one day and having a most beautiful conversation with him. He, he was one of those people that, you know when you talk to some people and they listen as if it's the first time they've heard words? Mm -hmm. With Gordon, he, it, 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 he was so present. You, you, you know, he'd be telling a story, and it was just like there was nothing else but Gordon telling it. It was an incredible ability he had, and I remember him talking about his commitment to the community he grew up in, which I think was Grassy Narrows. I think if I, I, I may be wrong on that, but he was talking about how important it was that our connections to where we come from are kept and 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 strengthened. And if you can't go back and help that community, that's important. And I, I was just like, man, man, this guy's like, I mean, he was, he was, uh, so when he passed, I'll tell you, it was a, it was a really tough couple of days for me. I was like, uh, happy in some ways to have known, you know, partly you're reveling in him, mm -hmm. you know, his beauty as a, as a, just a human being. Uh, yeah. and there were a lot in the show like that. Like, I think Tina was also like that. I didn't know Tina as well. 
uh, she's a little more private, but uh, Gordon, because I was next to him all the time, it was just a, you know, breath of fresh air. It really was. Yeah. It's amazing. And then I got to work with Art Hindle, a Canadian icon. Uh, Art played, uh, I think, an oil company guy who comes and uh, and I was working. I think that was uh, where we had protesters blocking the way. And uh, yeah. I remember I had seen Art in, and Art goes back to the early 70s of Canadian film. And he was a star. Yeah, what Art was the was show a, he was on regularly? Uh, ENG. Yeah. E N G he was I on, but was, he was uh, in an anagram. Yeah, E N G he was on, and I think that was on around the same time the North of Sixty was on. Yeah, I think maybe so. a little, yeah, around there. But he was in a film about the Toronto Maple Leafs. I can't remember what it was called, oh. where he played, uh, uh, and they used real Toronto Maple Leaf players, and oh. it, it was. Uh, I remember seeing it when I was quite young. I don't even know if it was like 72, maybe it was made, 73. So to, to meet Art and then become a friend with him, and he's just, the, again, one of those like Gortatusis spirits that is uh, is all about the process and there's no stardom, there's no, we're all doing this together. And, and Yeah, he was Harry Dobbs on North of 60. There, Harry Dobbs. There you go. Harry Dobbs. Look at him. I'm remembering the names. Good for you, man. <laughs> well, he was pretty regular for a while. Was, yeah, I, I think he came out for... Yeah, there was several back. in a row. He, I he was there for a bit, yeah. and then he came back for a bit again. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. And, and, and a, yeah. And Tracy Cook, uh, who I've just reached out to and, and uh, friended her on Facebook, and Tracy was always great to... Because just no... No BS. Tracy was a, a real actor who was just like, let's get to work. Let's, you know, and, and that's the other thing. That show, some shows, <laughs> you go on them and the ego flying around is, is, is hard to take. It's And, you you know, because I'm essentially a day player, that's what I do. I come out, I do my little small parts, and I leave. I don't mm -hmm. get the glory. So when you're shunned by the leads or, by, or feel a kind of a distance, it makes your job even harder or my job even harder because you sort of feel like, you know, what, have I got poop on my shoe or something? <laughs> um, but the good shows, that's not the case. So someone like Bill Macy from the Far first Fargo movie, I did a TV movie with him, and that's when I, the light bulb went off. Oh, oh, I get it. The good actors are good people. The crap actors are crap people. And, and you can pretty much go down the line and go, crap, crap, crap. Now, there are some exceptions to that. Uh, the first movie I ever was involved with was uh, I was a stand-in on a feature film in Toronto called Act of Vengeance, and Charles Bronson was the lead, and I was his stand-in. Oh wow! <laughs> in that case, uh, you must have been now, I, uh, <laughs> Charles Bronson was uh, not a pleasant fellow. He was in a, a very unhappy. Uh, very, uh, but it was the old system, right, where you have to protect yourself from all the because they're going to try to screw you. They're going to try to make you do. That's what a, a you know. Well, uh, and he, but he guy. treated he <laughs> treated everybody like crap. So it was an eco op opportunity. Uh, uh, and now, can I tell one story? A little, a little blue language, or is that not going to be? Yeah, can I tell good. a story? You can cut it out. <laughs> on uh, so the first film I'm working on, and I love you can tell I like to talk, and I love anecdotes. I love theater stories. I love the behind the things stories. They're always great because, you know, I've had some horrors happen to me, and I laugh about them now. Oh, In we fact, are enjoying the, your stories, yeah, honestly. The, the, the horror stories are actually in the moment. I remember on stage uh, a gun not going off, and it was supposed to. I was supposed to shoot myself <laughs> with a gun, and it didn't go off. And now, of course, I can't have a gun here that really works because I'll get burnt, or you know, mm -hmm. it's not safe. So the gun had to go off off stage, <laughs> and in that moment, I'm in a very high state of uh, emotion. Center stage, bunch of actors behind me, and I, of course, have to shoot myself and go down and. and but on this night, closing night, closing night, I hear from backstage, click, 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 click. And I hear a little little swearing under the, and I can hear it. And now I'm standing there going, because oh, oh, I can't, now I can't. And the first thing I think, okay, what can I do? And I, I literally, in my head, I think, I'll poison myself. And then I go, no, 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 no. I know, I'll stab myself with needles. 
That's what I thought. In a split second, like stab myself with needles in the eyes. And then I just went, I, I, of course I'm standing there, the audience is not reacting. They're just like, they know something's supposed to happen. So I just, I, I just fall down. And of course, I fall down and I'm turning away from the audience. And as I'm falling halfway down, I start laughing. Because I go, now, in my younger days, this would have been, I would have been really upset at the guy backstage. I was laughing. I was going, this is perfect. This is perfect. I hit the floor, and I'm moving. I'm moving like this. And my fellow actor upstage of me, looking at me, she's trying to keep a straight face. And another actor on stage wants the audience to know, to help them to know what's happening. So she intones very, very dramatically, he's dead. <laughs> And I'm moving. <laughs> Which makes me laugh. Okay. So, so it must have been the reflex thing. <laughs> here's the Charles. Here's the Charles Bronson story. So Charles Bronson, uh, not not a friendly fellow, but Wilfred Brimley was also on this movie, Act of Vengeance, Aww. and so he was sitting off stay off set with us one day. And of course, as a stand-in, when Bronson's on set, and they're shooting. I just stand away. I just leave the set and just sit off set a bit. So I don't remember why we were sitting as far away as we were, but Brimley was telling stories. And he says that at his, uh, his assistant, he had somebody who ran lines with him from mm -hmm. Toronto because we were shooting this in Toronto. And, and uh, so he had hired, they, he said, I want an actor to run lines with me. So they had hired this young woman. I think her name was Heidi, and she ran lines with him. And apparently through the years, he would just go, call Heidi, I want her to come to Pittsburgh or wherever he was shooting, and she would run lines with him off set. <laughs> anyway, so Brimley said, I told you the story of me meeting Charles Bronson. We we're like, no, no. And so he, he says, oh, it was a Western in the 60s, up in the desert. The uh, third AD is uh, walking me to set, and, and uh, Charles Bronson's coming off set. AD says to Charles Bronson, Mr. Bronson, this is Wilford Brimley. Wilford Brimley, Charles Bronson. And of course, I stick out my hand to shake his hand. And, and Bronson looks right past me to the third AD and says, I'll be in my Winnebago, and walks away. <laughs> and I look at the third AD and kind of shrugs. And so I turn, look back at Bronson walking away. I said, Mr. Bronson. And he turns around and looks at me, and I say, well, you're in your Winnebago. Why don't you go fuck yourself? <laughs> And apparently Bronson laughed, said, come on, let's have a drink. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff, sort of sums up Charles Bronson, but also Wilfred Brimley, where that was the day of men when men were men and women were nervous. It was, you know, it was very cutthroat. And I, I mean, I did a movie with Steven Seagal. That was a total crap show. Uh, don't know quite what planet he is from, but it's certainly not the planet that I, or in most of us, inhabit. Uh, uh, that's enough, that's like all I'll say. sweetheart in March for oh, Death. Does, doesn't Steven Seagal just look like a sweetheart? But a very conflicted Sorry, human being. Down. You know, I mean, so much, I mean, you, you can tell there are certain actors, like I just did Big Sky, and John uh, uh, Carroll, oh, I always wreck his name, he played, uh, he played Marge Gunderson's husband in the first Fargo movie. Oh, yeah. Who, who does the ducks, right? Yeah. John Carroll Lynch, sorry. John Carroll Lynch was on the show. And I got to do, I didn't get to do a scene with him, but I got to be, he, he shoots me with, a, with, a, with an object. <laughs> and uh, I, of course, uh, he shows up on set, and I'm like geeking out because I love this guy. Mm -hmm. And the reason I love him is because he's what I am. He's a character actor. He doesn't get the lead roles. He mm -hmm. doesn't, and, but that's okay. And same with Bill Macy. When, when I worked on with Bill Macy, it was just total ease. Like just, you know. We ran out of time. I guess we had one other question. Um, we don't find a lot about, uh, about Daryl. I mean, you, you are Daryl. Uh, Arthur Curtis's personal life. Where do you think he lived? Do you think he was married? Do you think he had kids? Yeah, yeah he had married a couple kids. Uh, you know, practice in the North. I'm sure there are a lot of lawyers that have 
to do contracts and whatnot. So I, I always had him based out of Edmonton, and and he would, you know, Gordon's character had money. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, and he could fly him anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's been great getting to meet you and talk to you. I mean, your stories have been really interesting. Um, we didn't well, expect it to be so colorful. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> that, yeah, that, that may not be a good thing. No, no it, it is. It's it it together. Is. No, it's great. Oh, it was wonderful, honestly. But yeah, well, thank, thank you very you. much.